such a great community partner. Uh, do you want to say a few words before we begin, or are we ready to go? Ready to go. Awesome. So again, a reminder to teachers and students to please turn your mics off and your video off just to help with the bandwidth today. So uh, hopefully that will eliminate some freezing problems with some of our students. And to continue things in a good way, JA Ottawa and the Ottawa Catholic School Board would love to start our day by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathering for this World of Choices event is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation, also called the Anishinaabe people. And we are grateful for such a beautiful, mild day today to, to be having our session. Uh, just a couple of quick words about our phenomenal panelists who have so generously donated their time today. Uh, we are going to be learning so much today from Alex Pound, who is a 12-year-old student who did some pretty incredible things at the beginning of this pandemic uh, in terms of innovation. We're going to be really thrilled to hear his story today. Uh, also, a huge welcome to Dr. Jennifer Jarose, who is an animal chiropractor, and let me tell you, I am beyond excited to learn about your job because I didn't even know that there was such a thing as animal chiropractors. So we are really, really excited that you're here. And also, who knew golf and steam? Not exactly what I thought of, but I think we're going to learn so much today from Derek McDonald. And Derek is uh, with the PGA. He is a head golf professional. Now, that if that isn't an incredible and exciting title, I don't know what it is. So we are so excited that our panelists are with us today. And let's get this show on the road. We are ready to talk and ask some questions. Um, so Alex, uh, I think we're going to start with you. And I have to know, tell me about your initiative. We hit this pandemic. It was so um, crazy at the beginning and we had so many concerns, not that we still don't, but here you are, you're 11 years old and you're sitting there and you're watching what's happening in the world and you decided that you could do something to help. Tell us a little bit about what you did, what, how you thought you could help. So I got a 3D printer for my 11th birthday on November. And uh, with that 3D printer, I heard, well, I heard my mom talking about how masks really hurt your ears. And so I decided to search up a model and print it. And she tried it and it really, really helped. And so I decided to send it to other people and then it just grew a lot. That's amazing. And from my understanding too, you couldn't keep up with demand. You ended up having to buy more printers. How many printers do you now have to do your initiative? So right now I have four. Four printers. And from working on these ear protectors for the masks, you've also moved on to another project as well. Yeah. Tell us a little so bit about that. I moved on to making mask boxes. So that's a place that you could put your mask. And so when you're eating snack or something at school, you don't need to put it on, let's say, your table and it gets dirty and stuff like that. So you put it inside the mask box and that the only thing that goes in there is a mask. Now, Alex, do you have any idea how many of the, the mask protectors or the ear protectors you've made at this point? It must be hard to keep track. I think just under 7,000. Holy cow. And are you still making these every day? Yeah, I am. How many do you do in, in an average day? Uh, average maybe 20 a day. Holy Hannah. <laughs> and do your parents help you? Yeah, they do. Awesome, awesome. So it's it's really something that's bonded you, I'm assuming, as a family. That's great. Uh, Dr. Jarose, I have to know, in the bio that I read about you, um, you work with large animals and small animals. Can you talk about some of the animals that you would see as part of your practice on a daily basis? So the majority of the animals I see are probably horses. I see those five days a week, I do them in the morning. I say I'm horses by day, dogs by night, or cats. Um, so I do see dogs, I see cats, but occasionally I'll get the rare animal. I had a paralyzed chicken over the summer. I've done a, a beef Angus bull. I've done a guinea pig. So I, I do get some randoms in there. 
but the majority is horses and dogs. Okay, you need to go back to the paralyzed chicken. Can you <laughs> describe that to us? Because that so, sounds crazy. I was going to a farm anyways to do the horses and she called me a couple days before and she's like, have you ever treated a chicken? And I said, no. And uh, she's like, well, I have one that stopped walking. So I said, well, let me reach out to a few of my colleagues. We have a big group of uh, chiropractors who treat animals all over the world. So I went on and I said, does anybody treat chickens? And I actually had two gals that say they just do birds. Um, so they messaged me and gave me some tips. So I went there and we knew the chicken had a disc issue, which would typically cause like uh, there's a little squishy part between your spine. And if it gets inflamed, it usually does cause leg pain in people. And in animals, they just choose not to use the legs anymore. Um, not that they're actually paralyzed. So I treated them. And after I treated them, well, I, I say, should say her, her name was Rosie. Um, she, uh, she was able to stand on one leg. So we treated her a second time and then she was able to stand on two legs. And then I said to the owner, I said, if this was a dog, I'd throw it in a swimming pool and I'd ask it to swim. And she goes, well, I have a pool. And I said, will the chicken swim? And she says, I have no idea. So they put this chicken in the pool and it skimmed right across the top. And uh, within two weeks, it was walking again. So, so some of our, our young guests today might not actually understand what a chiropractor is. Now, I think they've probably gotten a little bit of that from your answer, but could you just explain that to our guests today? So there's different types of practicing chiropractors, some that just treat your spine, so your back, if you have back pain or any issues in your back. And then there's ones who do more, I guess they're more labeled as sports chiropractors, even though it's a that's kind of a specific term, um, but they do soft tissue work. So your muscles, they deal with your muscles that attach to your joints, um, which is kind of what I do. I don't just adjust a joint or a bone. Um, I work on the muscles that are affecting that. Um, so yeah, so I mean, you can see a chiropractor if you have headaches or back pain, or if you sprain your ankle or if you hurt your wrists. So you can see a chiropractor for a lot of things where a lot of them are turning more I guess in a physio base, I know more people probably understand what a physio does. So we do give exercises. I give my horses and dogs exercises to do. I give homework to their owners that they have to do at home um, so they can help their animals. I have to ask, are the animals ever reluctant? Because obviously I know as a human being, sometimes we don't like to do those exercises. Do the, the animals need coaxing into doing I, the I actually like working on the animals better than people, just for the fact that when I do give exercises, I know the owners will do them. Where if I gave it to a human, they'd do it for a day or two and then they'd stop. Um, but yeah, no, most of the animals, I'd say 90 90, 95% really do enjoy the treatments. Uh, the first visit is always a little hesitant because they're probably the most sore when I see them. But right. usually the second time a dog will come in and they, they don't, they give me a lick on the face and they turn around and sit with their back in front of me. And they already know what they need to do. Amazing. Amazing. We're going to turn to you now, Derek. Speaking of sore backs, um, I wonder with all the swinging that you have to do um, as a golf professional, do you get a lot of sports injuries or do you see a lot of sports injuries in, in the, the, the professional golf? Yeah, we do tend to see um, a fair amount of them. Uh, myself, I'm lucky. I, I don't get to play as much golf anymore. I always tell everyone, if you want to play golf, don't become a golf professional because you're probably not going to play very much anymore. Um, but no, my students, uh, definitely, they, uh, they work with different chiropractors and physiotherapists um, if they have any lower back issues and such, maybe in their shoulders, um, some wrist injuries that we might come across as well in golf. Can you tell us a little bit about your job for those people who are sitting back and saying, this sounds like a good gig. I'd like to be a golf professional. Can you describe what a day in your uh, profession is like? Uh, sure. So um, I'm now the academy manager at the Royal Ottawa Golf Club. So um, I'm essentially the head of instruction here. And uh, so any of our academy programs, that's what I run. So we have all of our junior programs, our junior camps, our clinics, um, different camps that we might do for, like you say, over a weekend for the, we have like different ladies camps. Um, plus I do all the individual coaching as well. So I uh, work with a lot of one-on-one -on -one privatized uh, coaching and lessons. Um, I've been fortunate to uh, work with a couple people on the PGA Tour. Um, I've worked with a few guys on the PGA Tour Canada. Um, sorry, I just got a call coming through here. Let's decline that. Sorry about that. Busy guy. 
<laughs> um, and uh, I got uh, some students down in uh, scholarships uh, down south uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, so it's been uh, it's quite hectic. It's busy. The the summer days uh, are not eight hour days. They tend to be more ten to twelve hour days. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely my passion. Now, some people on the line might be sitting back and saying, what does golf have to do with science, tech, engineering? But I think even just watching you, we can see the screen behind you. And yeah. obviously, technology has become a part of your job. Can you talk about that a little bit, how you use uh, science, math, or technology in your day-to-day -day work? For sure. Um, yeah, no, science is a big part of my, of my daily routines now. Uh, who would have thought when I was uh, 14 or 15 thinking that being a golf pro would be cool, that I'd have to know all this science-y stuff. Um, but uh, no, it's um, quite drastic. So this uh, kind of machine that I'm hitting into right now, it's called TrackMan. Um, it's a Doppler radar launch monitor. So it's literally tracking what this club is doing to the golf ball at impact um, and being able to measure all kinds of different parameters. Um, and so it tells us what happened at impact and why the ball did what it did. Um, it's extremely accurate. Um, plus I use 3D motion capture systems. So I have sensors all over people's body and I can measure every angle that their body is moving at any different point in the golf swing. Um, I use pressure mats. So that's uh, things that we're gonna stand on and force plates where I can actually now measure the forces that are being put into the ground by the golfer. Um, it's kind of wild. Uh, it's, it's endless. Like it's everything that you can do with a golf club. I'm now essentially able to measure. Um, so I, when I'm making changes with people's golf swings, I'm not guessing, I'm not just going off of a, maybe a personal preference or uh, something that might look like something uh, you might see on TV. It's really understanding how that person moves and getting them to move more efficiently, more better. Let's call it that way. Yeah, so if I was a professional golfer and I came to you and said, look, it, I'm, I noticed that I'm hooking, and I'm not even sure I'm using yeah. the right term here, but yeah, I'm no, that's right. hooking my swing and I'm, I'm always ending up in the forest instead yeah. of on the green, um, the technology that you're using is going to help identify what I'm doing wrong. It really is. It, and the one thing it does is it, it tells us what happened, um, you know, between the golf club and the golf ball, which the golf ball doesn't know what we do. It doesn't care about how we look, how we swing. All it knows is how did this club make contact with it? Based off of physics and geometry uh, and mathematics, then um, the ball is going to curve and go certain heights and spin certain amounts. Um, and with the technology we have these days, it, it's, like, it's so accurate. It measures these things extremely accurately. So we're not guessing anymore. We really know what's going on. So we can make changes with people a lot quicker as opposed to let's try this, let's try that. We actually will know what's what's going on. So people can improve what they're doing so much more quickly. Oh, so much more, oh, extremely quick. Like uh, I always tell everyone, it's um, it's not rocket science, but it's science. Um, and uh, once we understand a little bit of how this operates, uh, we can really make people change. We can change their ball flights very, very quickly. I'm going to ask uh, what's uh, potentially a silly question, but how quickly, if somebody gets a really good swing in on a golf ball, how fast is that golf ball traveling? Um, so it depends on the club that they're hitting. So if you look at, um, we have uh, essentially 13 clubs in our bag plus a putter. Um, and each one of those clubs has a different angle to this club face. So right now, this is my seven iron. So my seven iron has, let's call it a, about a 34 degree angle in that club face. So it's meant to get the ball a certain height, um, you know, whether uh, sooner or later, some get, get it up quicker, some get it out there, same height, but maybe late, later on in the ball flight, like a driver. So depending on, let's say you're hitting a driver, that ball could be going, let's say for really fast club head speed players, that ball could be traveling at close to 170 to 180 miles per hour. Which would be why people shout four when they uh, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been hit once before. Uh, it's not fun. Um, it nailed me right in the knee and it dropped me like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? <laughs> Didn't feel good. <laughs> I'm going to turn uh, back to you, Alex, for a few minutes. Um, so, Alex, can you tell me um, if you think when you grow up that you're going to have a career that includes science or technology? Is this something that's in your future plans? Yeah, uh, it is. I, I really want to become like a computer engineer. Okay. And where did that start, Alex? Where did that uh, interest or passion in that begin? I'm not sure. Was I just, it 
playing really, computer games really like or tinkering with them. Oh, you like tinkering. Okay. And is there like a teacher that uh, has really inspired you or has a lot of that drive come from home? Uh, I think a lot of it came from home and maybe a summer camp, like a coding camp. Okay. So you're into coding. So what kind of programs do you use when you're coding? I'm starting to learn JavaScript and hypertext markup language. Okay, and do you find it challenging or is this just something really exciting when you're getting in there? Or maybe it's both, maybe it's challenging and exciting. Yeah, it's both. It's really hard, but really fun. Good stuff. And are you able to spend time doing your coding and learning while you have, you know, your mate, you're printing 20 of these ear protectors a day? That's a lot on your plate. Well, yeah, I do have a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. So... When you were starting to code the machines, um, did you did you get help from somebody when you were working on the coding? Well, for the printer? Yes. Yeah. When well, you were making one, your... It came in many pieces, the actual printer itself. And my, me and my dad, we put it together. My dad's awesome. the tech guy. <laughs> oh, good. So you've got a really great role model to learn from. <laughs> awesome. i got to ask you, it must feel pretty good to be able to give back to your community. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like when you started donating these, um, these ear printers, uh, protectors, um, like things picked up pretty quickly, I would assume, where they started to learn about it. What did it feel like when you started to be able to give back to your community? I don't know. It was really good. I really like helping people when they need help, and it was really fun too, so... Awesome. And for our teachers who are on um, the uh, regular chat, uh, we'd love to see your questions for our, um, for our wonderful guests today. Um, so as those come in, we will ask. Now, Jennifer, I'm going to turn back to you again as well. Can you talk a little bit about your education? Uh, what kind of training did you have to get to become an animal chiropractor? So to get accepted into the animal school, which is completely separate school, um, you have to either go to vet school or to human chiropractic school. So you have to make the decision which you want to do first. Um, what made me lean towards the human chiropractic, not that I really wanted to work with people, I totally just wanted to do animals, um, is I'm from the U.S., and certain states, if I wanted to be a vet, I'd have to um, have half my practice still working as a vet and the, the other half could be the holistic side. So meaning chiropractic. Um, so I wanted to do just the chiropractic. So that's the reason I went to the human side of chiropractic school first. And then after you get through, so you have to do your undergrad. So four years of undergrad. So when you say years. undergrad, for our young listeners, um, we're talking about university? University. Or yes. Uh, university. So you need a four-year bachelor's degree. I believe it's still the same here, bachelor's. Um, so you go to your um, university. Then you get accepted into the chiropractic program. There's a chiropractic program in Toronto. It's a four-year program. The one that I went to in the States was three and a quarter years because we had to go through the summer. Um and then after that, then you can go to the animal program, which is about nine months. It's a condensed program. Um, so it's about a two-year program put into nine months. Amazing. Now, before I forget, there was a question from earlier. They wanted to know what the dog's name was. Oh, she's tired because she went on a walk and trying to get her to get up. Look, there's a squirrel. Maybe that'll get her. <laughs> this, this is Ari. <laughs> she's... She's my little sidekick and my helper when I have to do demos. So this is Ari. She's 10 years old. She was a rescue in, that I got when I lived in Chicago. And uh, I've had her since she's been five weeks old. And now she's 10. She's very gray. <laughs> I, I love that uh, Ari is your, your demonstrator. That's interesting. I never thought about that. But I guess that makes a lot of sense to have a live model to show things. Yeah, so sometimes when I have to send people exercises, I'll show them in the office, but they'll get home and they say, I don't think I'm doing it right. So then Ari kind of sits there for me to demonstrate something on and I can videotape it and send it to them. And uh, she actually went to chiropractic school with me. So 
at first she didn't like it. She used to run away from me and I'd chase her around the house. And I'm like, people pay me for this. Get back here. But uh, it's probably because when at chiropractic school at the animal program, we had a lot of vets and, and myself who were poking on her and we didn't really know what we were doing. So yes. she probably, like it took her a couple of years to come around to like it. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Well, good job, Ari. That's amazing. Um, lots of questions are coming in. I do want to ask one uh, from Alex, and then there are a few for Derek uh, in particular, and, and some of it involves getting uh, getting some swings in there, Derek, so hopefully that's <laughs> something we can do. Uh, but sure. Alex, uh, what design software do you use um, when you're creating your, your, your pieces? So for the box, I use Tinkercad, which is a really simple 3D modeling software website. Oh. Great. And where did you learn uh, about Tinkercad? I learned it from a summer camp, too. Oh, that's great. That is super great. Okay, we're going to come back to you again, Alex, for sure. But, uh, Derek, um, Miss McLean's uh, grade five, six class would like to know how long you've been a golf pro. Oh, good question. Um, I've been a golf pro for 15 years. Um, I've been playing since uh, I was 10, so I'm going to give my age here. So that's uh, 30, uh, 30 years I've been playing golf. So. That's amazing. And that, that also, there were a couple of people, uh, Miss Ostrom's class was asking that as well. And Miss Calver's class, her students really would like to see you hit a ball, but can you do that where you are? Or can you just do a swing? Yeah, no, I can hit a ball here. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, okay. So just so everyone knows, there's a, a machine that's actually behind me, and that's what's measuring uh, the club and the golf ball. And then it's going to come up on the screen here in a second. So once I hit one. Wow. And so there we go. And what I can't exactly see what it says on your screen, but it looks like something came up on, on the, the actual screen itself. Am I yeah, right? Yeah, correct. Um, can you still see me if I move away from the camera a little bit here? Yes. Okay. So all of these numbers that are on the bottom, um, they're different parameters that the technology can measure. Um, and all of those different parameters, those, those tiles, those numbers are telling me different things that happen with the club and the golf ball which once, we, once we're able to measure those, we can then, like when we're indoors and we're not actually tracking the golf ball outdoors, because if we're outdoors, this machine will actually track the golf ball the whole time it's in the air. And so it's extreme, it's a, like, well, to give you an idea for accuracy, um, just on distance alone, when it's outdoors, it's accurate to within one foot from 100 yards. So that's the length of a football field. Um, and then it's accurate to within one yard, so a meter stick um, right. from 300 yards. So it's extremely accurate. And based off of all of these numbers that it can measure, the science behind it tells us what the ball would have done when we're outdoors. Um, and I can tell you, so I've been using this technology now for about 10 years, and I have all the faith in the world in this uh, technology. Um, what we see on here truly is what we would see outdoors. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, Ms. Nelson Cook's class wants to know, what is your favorite golf club to use? Uh, I get that question a lot now. Okay. So it's probably not going to be the nice answer that everyone wants to hear. Um, I don't have one. And the reason is all the clubs are meant to do something different. And so what, when I'm trying to help people get better, I don't want them to think like, Oh, I don't like this club. Um, even though they need to hit it based off of how far they are from the golf, from the hole. Um, and if they have this negative thought in their head, they may not hit it well because of that. So I try and get people to understand. I, there's no, like for me, I don't have a favorite club. I don't have a club I don't like. Um, I just have to use each club based on the shot we need to try and hit. Awesome. Uh, Alex, we have a question from Mr. Grant's class. I think it's Mr. Grant. How many orders do you receive in a week? And how much does it cost to make the pieces that you're, you're putting out? Well, in a week, it depends when. So on an average week, I get like 20 orders, maybe more. Okay. Well, that's good. We don't have to be completely bang on there. I think a, a good estimate is, is great. And when you're producing these pieces, like how I know that you started a GoFundMe account. How much does it make? How much does it cost for like one set of your protectors, like one of those? I don't know, but a roll of filament, would, um, would, that cost $20, I think. 
Okay, and how long would a roll of filament last you, Alex? Maybe 300, 500 ear protectors. Okay, so you can get quite a bit out of the out of one roll. That's really great. All yeah. right, so there's a question from Miss Moore's class, and this is from Gabriella, who's in grade six, and this is for you, Dr. Jennifer. Why are chiropractors important for animals? So I find, I guess what I find, um, I have a lot of sports, uh, like athletic horses that compete and same thing with the dogs. I have dogs that do dock diving and, and something called agility. And I mean, there's so many sports out there for dogs. There's ratting where they have to search for rats and tubes. And, um, there's something called Shitson, which is kind of your police attack dogs that kind of go after someone who has the big sleeve on. Um, uh, there's fly ball where they run in a tag team back and forth past each other to catch a ball that flies out at them and they have to run back. So it's kind of a relay race. So those are athletes, just like our athletes in, in the world, uh, human side of things and they get injured. So I do see a lot of injured, um, dogs that are sports and same with horses. They compete, they jump, uh, they race. Uh, so they all get injured. So it helps maintain them. We can rehab them and give them programs to bring them back if they injure a leg uh, or their back. Uh, I have a couple dogs that, like right now, I have a dog that's coming to see me tonight and it injured its discs. So it's not using its back legs right now. And the only option that the vets are giving it is a really expensive surgery, almost like $10,000. Wow. And there's no guarantee that that's going to work. So I've seen the dog for about two weeks and we've been doing some modalities. So like we use ultrasound, which increases the blood flow. And we've been using acupuncture, which is needles that I can put in the back to help reduce pain. Um, and she messaged me yesterday that the dog ran out of her arms yesterday, not the prettiest run, but it used its legs a little bit. So we can bring them back. We just got to be patient. Uh, so yeah, so I do. See, and I see a lot of older dogs. So dogs that you know, are struggling to get up, struggling to go upstairs. We can do a lot of rehab stuff to strengthen them as well. Now I've had acupuncture myself and some of our students might not realize like when the doctor was putting, um, the physio person was putting the needles in my back, I really didn't feel it. Is it the same for the dogs? Do they feel it? The is, it is. And I might actually have a needle here. If you give me one second. I'll see if I can. Sure. Yeah. I can't wait to see how big this name is, whether it's small or little. And while we're waiting for that, Alex, where did you get your 3D printer? Uh, Miss Stiff's class would like to know. So uh, the company that makes it is called, I think, Ender, because there are types of 3D printer called like Enders and then the number. I have four right. Ender 3s. Oh, wow. And so I wonder, have, have your parents complained about your electricity bill going up with all these printers running? No, they haven't. <laughs> I don't think it goes up that much. Well, that's good. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Um, and can you, do you have an ear protector? I know you're at school today, Alex. Do you actually have a, an ear protector to show us? or? Uh, no, I don't have it on me uh, right now, but I have like an image of it. <laughs> Yeah, and somebody wanted to know, Alex, if you still go to school, but we know you do because you're actually at school right now with us this morning. Yeah. All right, Jennifer, uh, you're back. Dr. Jennifer, do we have this needle? So this this is in the package. You might get a better look, but I'll take this one out. So they all come individually wrapped because they have to be sterile. They do come in different lengths, but on the dogs and horses, this is probably, it comes in a little tube. And then when I take it out, I don't know if you can see that. I'll put something behind yeah. it. So that's the size. It's very, very small. Yeah. Um, really so tiny. They, and the nice thing about the tube is when it's in the tube, let's see uh -huh. if I can get it back in. I push the tube up against the skin. So they feel the pressure of the tube and then I tap the needle in. So they feel the tube more than they do the needle. Got it. Now, um, Miss Simpson's class wants to know, Dr. Jennifer, what is the weirdest animal that you've worked on? I, I was pretty stunned with the paralyzed chicken, Rosie, but uh, is there another animal that's been really unusual that you've worked on? The beef Angus bull was a little intimidating, I'm not going to lie, because he was about 1,800 pounds, and bulls sometimes can not be the friendliest of animals, but he loved it. Wow. Um, 
but I have colleagues who work on farm animals in the state. So I have some that have done tigers. I have some that have, I had one who did a dolphin. Really? So, yeah. It, it had an issue with a, a fin in the back and, and stuff. So they actually brought him in and they've contained the dolphin like they do to, uh, it was at a sanctuary. So they contained it like they would do for a vet check. And he went in and he got in the water and he felt the back. However, he did say that they had a very strong muscle in the back. So he couldn't do too much, unfortunately. Okay. And too so like, you're, you're working with very small animals and then very big animals. What's the adjustment like for you personally, when you're, you're switching from, from one to the other, do you have to think about that a lot? Not so much because their bone structure is very similar and same with the muscle of from a dog, at least from a dog to a horse, the muscle position is very similar. Obviously the chicken was a little different and a guinea pig is a little different, yes. um, but it's the same thing I would say with a human chiropractor who has to treat an infant versus an adult or a very large adult versus someone very thin. Um, so we all have to kind of adapt our techniques, which we learn through schooling and practice. Um, but I, I do say that horses are way easier to adjust than dogs and people. Got it. All right, Derek, we're, we're going to turn back to you for a minute. And sure. there's some questions coming in about injuries because, you know, obviously medicine is an important part of, of uh, the golfing profession. And they were wondering, what is the worst golf injury you've seen, either yourself or someone else? Um, hmm. Well, I haven't, luckily I haven't seen anything too crazy, but I mean, I've heard of like, you know, people having to get uh, uh, knee surgeries done. Um, now it's usually with, um, you know, when you start talking with golf professionals, uh, and I'm talking more professional golfers, let's call it. So let's be clear. We have golf professionals like myself, but then we have professional golfers like, you know, right. you, uh, you see on TV. Um, those, those guys and girls that you see on TV, I mean, they're spending, you know, eight, nine hours a day practicing. So there's a lot of wear and tear that goes on in the body. Um, so they might tend to have some, some knee injuries, um, some, some elbow issues, some wrist issues. I mean, I luckily haven't seen anything crazy. Um, I know there's lots of lower back pains, uh, you know, when we're doing a lot of twisting and turning at really fast rates, um, you know, throughout this motion, uh, depending on how bent over someone stays, maybe for too long, we can start to, to really injure them, the lumbar spine, which is the lower part of your back. Um, so some people might have some major issues down there at times, but uh, luckily nothing too, too crazy that, uh, that I have seen anyways. I, I'm sitting up a little straighter now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that posture kind of helps, right? <laughs> sure, sure does. Um, Alex, uh, another question for you. This is from Mr. Grant, his class. What is the first object that you made with a 3D printer? Ah, uh, that's hard. I think it might have been, well, it was a model of a dog, actually. Okay. Oh, yeah. I like that. Well, th there's all these little links between all three of you guys <laughs> today. <laughs> um, and uh, Alex, for those people who I know you don't have an air protector with you, but can you describe to our audience today what the air protector looks like? How big is it? Even show us with your hands. Like this big. Okay. And made of plastic filament. And what color is it? Any color that I set it to on the printer. Okay, so you can control and is it, is it like injected with ink then? It's that you don't have to worry that the filament comes as a certain color. No, the, it's only the filament that comes as a certain color. So if the filament is blue, then it's going to come out as blue. Got it. Okay. Uh, and Derek um, Chiamanda in uh, Miss McLean's class would like to know why you decided to become a golf pro. Ah, good question. Um, I was addicted to the game probably since I was about, I'd say, 12. Um, I wouldn't say it would happen right from the get-go, but uh, when I started when I was 10, but it, a couple years into it. Um, and I, I will say this. I, I guess I've always been um, a realist. In, I played golf at the highest level. I played in all the, the big events as an amateur um, and as a junior growing up. But I also realized I wasn't going to ever be on TV. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. th those those uh, uh, guys and girls that we see on TV are extremely exceptional. Um, 
But I also knew that my most enjoyment came from when I worked with my coach when I was younger. Um, and we were actually, um, he was coaching me. He, we were on the range grinding it out, trying to figure stuff out. I enjoyed that aspect of it probably even more than playing golf um, and playing in necessarily tournaments and stuff like that uh, was just him and I just grinding on the range. And um, so, yeah, I kind of knew at a pretty young age that uh, being a uh, instructor and being a teacher is um, kind of what I was going to go towards. Awesome. Uh, Jennifer, uh, we have a question from Miss Brett's class. Do you use Centurion or Beamer blanket? That's a very specific question from Sophie in grade six, who is a huge horse lover. I was going to say, she must have horses if she knows those two technologies. So, um, <laughs> so what those are, are those are, for those who don't know, they're blankets that you can put on your horses. It actually offers something called pulsed electromagnetic therapy. So a big word, basically wow. it helps to increase the circulation um, using magnets uh, to help horses with injuries or to help um, heal sore muscles. So I have clients that have both of them. I don't use them personally because I, well, actually I, I should take that back. I have a blanket for the dogs called sports innervation. It's out of Germany offers the same treatment. Um, those blankets are designed to be used almost every day. So I find for me to use it on a horse just once a month, because typically I'll see a horse maybe once a month, that's a maintenance. It won't offer the benefits of using it every day, but I do recommend clients if the, if it's going to benefit their horse to definitely get them. They're just a pricey additive to their yeah. normal expenses, um, yeah. but they do work well. So I like all of them, but sports innovation is the one I use. So it's the same type of blanket. We don't hear about it much because it's out of Europe. But uh, I do like the Beamer. I like the Centurion. They're both really, really good. All right, Alex, I think I can't believe how quickly the time has gone, uh, my friends. I think we're probably down to our last question. Now, we do have a ton of additional questions in the chat. Um, and we will, uh, hopefully, our, our guests can stay behind for a couple minutes. Uh, what we'll do is we're hoping to get the answers to remaining questions uh, from our panelists, and we will send them to our teachers if we're, we're able to do that. Uh, but Alex, our, our last question is for you, and this is from Mrs. Nisbet's class. They'd like to know what you're thinking about for projects for the future. Are there any more projects that you're thinking about? Not really at the moment. Right now I'm printing what I print, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, and that, that's keeping you pretty busy from the sounds of it. So, yeah. Oh, and somebody wanted to know, do you sell them? Or are they so, all donations? Uh, the mask boxes, those are, well, there's a child size and there's an adult size. Adult size is $10 and um, child size is eight. Perfect. And Alex, maybe uh, the other thing after the call is we can get the information from you on where people can go uh, if they want to get those. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I cannot believe that our time has come to an end. Um, and wow, I know I learned a lot today. And hopefully our grade six uh, classes across the OCSB did as well. Uh, I do want to put a big push in tonight. Uh, for our, we're actually doing a really great talk with uh, jobtalk.ca's John Callagher. And he's going to be talking about five reasons to consider a career in the trades. Um, so that might be something that our educators uh, can pass on to teachers. We still have registration parents. Great. Um, oh, and we're hoping educators will jump on the line too. Uh, but we're hoping our, our educators uh, will share that with parents for tonight uh, because registration is still open. And uh, teachers can find that information on the STEAM Week website. Um, STEAM Week is going to continue. We've got more great events. We've got another wonderful uh, on field presentation uh, tomorrow with our um, high school students. And Friday is our live coding day. So a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Jennifer DeRose, to Alex Pound, and to Derek McDonald for sharing your time, your kindness, and your wisdom. And a huge shout out to Christina Price 
and everybody at JA for helping coordinate today. We couldn't have done this without our community partners. We all are stronger together. Have a fantastic day, uh, and I hope it's, uh, it's a great one. Bye. Okay, so I think um, 